redeemer, vindicator, defender, kinsman, rescuer, savior, guardian, protector, advocate. These are among the many terms that various Bible translators use to describe the Hebrew word goel. It refers to an ancient Middle Eastern custom that seems to predate even the nation of Israel. We find it used exclusively throughout the Old Testament scriptures, often describing the Lord, but it's a word or concept that does not translate well into New Testament Greek, and even less so into our modern-day English. So why, then, do we so often associate this term Redeemer with God, the Son, when nowhere in Scripture is he ever clearly referred to by that title? Well, perhaps the best translation for the idea of goil is that of a closest relative. More specifically, the word describes a closest relative who incurs certain specific responsibilities. And but before we look at each of these functions, let's first remember that Jesus is our closest relative. We've been adopted as children to God, as we saw in our lesson yesterday. And while Jesus is the only Son begotten of the Father, He is by no means the only Son. Because Paul tells us in Galatians 3 and verse 26, For all of you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It's extremely difficult to fathom that our God could elevate us to the status of being a brother and fellow heir with the Messiah Himself. It is, however, precisely in this unique position as our closest relative that we see Jesus dutifully fulfilling the role of our goel, as we read in the Hebrew. Let's look at the responsibilities that we find in scriptures of a goel and see how our Lord Jesus performed each duty. Well, the goel was to buy back land sold by his kinsmen. Remember that the idea of inheritance was of great importance in Hebrew society. At times, one would find themselves in debt and sell their inherited land to repay that debt. Well, in order to keep the inheritance in the family, the goil was required by the Lord to buy the land back, and the new owner was required to sell it back to the family, as we see in Leviticus 25 and verse 23. Likewise, from the beginning, Man was intended to walk in a paradise with God, and we have sold this inheritance because of our sin, and it's Jesus who has paid the price to return this inheritance to us, as Paul shows us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 18. But also, if the debt was more severe, Sometimes an individual would sell themselves into servitude in order to work off that debt. In this case, the goel was to ransom the relative by paying whatever remained of his debt. We see this in Leviticus 25, verses 47 through 49. Well, in a similar fashion, we have all sold ourselves into bondage to Satan because of our sin. And it's Jesus who sets us free from this debt of slavery, as we read in Romans chapter 6. Well, in the case of one Hebrew killing another, we see that it was then the grim task of the goel, or the blood avenger, to execute the sentence of judgment on his kinsman's murderer by putting the culprit to death. Numbers chapter 35, verses 6 through 34 address this. Well, going back to Eden, we see that Eve and Adam died because of their sin, Genesis 2, 17, and the devil was a murderer from the beginning, John 8 and verse 44. Well, in the same way, we have each forfeited our lives to sin, but it's Jesus who is our vindicator and has defeated both sin and death in order to avenge our deaths. Now, friends, much more could be said on this subject, but I want to conclude with the words of Job, who in the midst of the struggle of his life yearned for his Redeemer, for his Goel. He says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, 
and at the last shall take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh shall I see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Likewise, friends, may our hearts faint within us as we yearn for our Redeemer, Christ Jesus. Friends, we thank you for joining us for our program today, and may God bless you with a wonderful day.